Hi there. Welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Today we're going to talk about the Spirit of Elijah part 2. And if you have not watched part 1, I would really recommend it because it forms the foundation of part 2. Um, every house has a foundation and without it nothing else can be built upon it. So it's important that you watch part 1 as well. So today's devotional teaching will be packed full and probably quite long. I will see towards the end, obviously, and you will know beforehand. <laughs> and um, it, as per usual, it will be uh, have some dreams and visions in it. And, you know, this is just Father's way that he has chosen to bring his message across to me, um, either by giving me dreams or visions or allowing people to have dreams and visions and then telling me about it. And as per the case with the dreams and visions that I will speak about in this devotional teaching, um, it once again, as it's been every time, is that the people that give it to me, that share their dreams and visions with me, didn't know what Father was busy with um, in preparing for the devotional teaching. So it just, it's just amazing how he just allows the body to minister to one another in this context. So in the uh, uh, previous uh, devotional, I was talking, um, I mentioned that I had a vision and the vision had two parts to it. The first part of the vision was that, that I saw a man being tied to an altar with leather straps. And that is what part one of the Spirit of Elijah was about. And it was about tying the altar to the, the, the sacrifice to the altar of the horns. And allowing God to have his way in us in order to produce that spirit of Elijah. So it's important to watch that devotional teaching. And the second part of the vision was where I started walking with my wolf. That's all that I saw. So today's uh, spirit of Elijah will be about that wolf section. And that I will give you an explanation where it comes from and how Father opened this whole wolf uh, theme to me and um, like a sanctified version of it so that we can understand we know that he talks in symbolism in in scripture he at you know we find that in the garden of eden we have the the snake or the serpent that beguiled eve um, but we also have him telling us yeshua that we need to be cunning as serpents so uh, animals and various things he can use in whatever way to give a message to us. So this is the same example as that. Um, the other thing as well that we will be discussing in the second part. So the first part will be about the wolf. The second part will be about the doctrine of Jezebel. Because Jezebel is the one that comes against the prophets. So specifically that spirit of Elijah that will come up against the spirit of Jezebel in this last time. So it will be, we will discuss about the the, Je the doctrine of Jezebel and, and what that means and just what Father has come to show me. So I, you know, the, the call upon my life is to prepare the worker bride for the time to come. And if that is the spirit that we will be facing, it will be good to have an understanding what it will take to come against that type of spirit in the time to come. Okay, so um, let's start with the with the wolf. Now, as you can see behind me, I've made the video so that you can see the painting behind me. You'll see there a little girl with um, a scroll in her hand. She's crouched and she's looking intently upon the scroll. And then there's that wolf that is there right by her side. Now, this is a vision that I got probably hmm, maybe two and a half years ago. Um, let's say two years ago and um, what happened is I just saw the girl first this girl and she was looking at the scroll with this beautiful white dress on very intently looking upon the scroll and the next moment I saw this majestic wolf appearing above her and it was really a beautiful wolf with gold and ochre colors and reds beautiful um, and, and that is what I saw. And the idea that I had about this wolf that is that this wolf was protective over this little girl. And when Father showed me this little girl, I had a clear understanding what that was about. But the wolf was confusing me because according to scripture, there's nothing really positive about a wolf. Um, you know, we know about wolves and uh, uh, sheep. Yeah, wolves in sheep's clothing, um, 
<clears throat> we know that wolves come to devour. We know it's got to do with deception. So, you know, even Yeshua says that he sends us like sheep to the slaughter amongst wolves. So the connection to it confused me. Um, but then Father started um, bringing uh, this information and opening it up to me, what the wolf has uh, the connection to it. And, you know, I just simply asked him, I said, Father, you need to show me what this means because I, I don't understand. I can't go on any preconceived ideas. You, want, you must show me what this is about. And not long after that, my daughter and I, we decided that we were going to watch something on, uh, uh, on TV and we were looking for something to watch. And the first thing that we found very quickly in the first few minutes was a story called Vicky and Mystery, which is about a little girl and her wolf. And so obviously I knew Father wanted me to watch it. And it's just basically about this girl that um, received this dog, which ended up to be a wolf. And the man who sold her or gave her this dog told her that it's a mystery not knowing um, where this dog came from. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, it was a wolf, and this wolf and she became very good friends. Um, so that's an important connection there as well. And, you know, he, uh, I was listening to a teaching of somebody. Whilst listening, the person was talking about John 10. Um, John 10 talks about the wolves, the hirelings um, that breaks in, and the sheep that knows his voice. Um, and... The person mentioned wolves at that moment and the spirit told me to look up a constellation of a wolf. So I don't know anything about constellations. It's a bit scary what I know. But, you know, I go by faith and wouldn't you know that it, it, there's a constellation of a wolf with a little child in it as well. So it was clearly showing me this is from me. I want you to take note. I'm working something in you. And since then, he has been giving me stuff about wolves coming on my way like nobody's business. And then it faded away again as it was no longer something that he wanted me to pay attention to. And then lately he brought it up again. So let's get on with it. Um, to One of the other things that he uh, uh, brought upon my path is... One is a vision and the other one is a dream of two people that um, that did not know about the context of what he has shown me. Now, I've said that the Queen of the South in Luke 11, Yeshua, told the disciples in the discourse that, at the, during the tribulation, that the Queen of the South with the men of this generation will rise in judgment to condemn this wicked generation. So, judgment... Um, is speaking of darkness and it's speaking of um, of condemning of condemning people you know and so I'm saying this in light of the dream that my friend Simone had and the dream that she had was that she came to my house and I was in uh, we were going to go to a reunion together and I was um, in my room, she's sitting there with me, and when she walked in, she saw that I had uh, black lipstick on, black eyeliner, black nails, black hair, I was just completely painted black, so to say, and um, we went to, and she just asked me, are you sure you're doing the right thing, and she said in my dream, I was like, yes, yes, no, this is, this is the look I'm going for. And when we got to the reunion, the people did not like the way I looked. They were just not in approving at all. Um, and she came up for me um, and she defended me and said, you know how much she's meant for you. She know, you know what she's done um, in uh, her teachings and devotionals and all those things. So she was just coming up for me. And then she said that I treated them with love and I wasn't phased one bit about this. And at that time, Father showed me what the interpretation of that was. And that was that the, uh, the me being completely in black nails, black hair and all those kind of things was um, me being painted in a black light because of what I will speak and that it will be judgment that will come from my mouth. So it's like, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the soothsaying prophets are all, all flowers and, 
and and bees and pretty little things you know tickling our ears but um, the prophets that that have the burden of the lord upon them often were seen as prophets of doom and that's why um, ahab told elijah are ye him who troubleth israel are you the one that's making it so difficult for us with all your doom that you're spreading around so it's being painted in a black light so uh, another lady that had a vision of me also didn't know anything about the wolf she said that she had a vision of me where i was looking in a mirror and i um, looked like i normally look now on these videos and she passed me and um, the spirit told her to turn back towards me and when she turned to me again my whole face turned into a black wolf and I had um, my mouth wide open with sharp, the sharp teeth showing. Um, so I can only imagine um, that how she must have felt when she saw that. I mean, if I had to see that um, about, about anybody else, I would place a huge question mark over that person. So, but little did she know the significance of what Father was showing her. So that's that with the wolf as well. Okay, so the on my reset research with regards to the wolf the lord led me to the tribe of benjamin and um, the tribe of benjamin is what i want to show through this video with regards to the wolf and the tribe of benjamin is that the tribe of benjamin is a type and shadow of elijah john the baptist the queen of the south and the smyrna group these are all types and shadows but they, they form basically the same thing, which is that worker group that will be here during the tribulation to bring in the great harvest. Okay, so the focus, I think I've, I've in my teachings, I've focused on the Queen of the South. I've done a devotional called Remember Me, Church of Smyrna. Very important um, devotional teaching. Um, and now I'm doing Elijah, which is linked to John the Baptist, because Yeshua said he is as Elijah. That has come and now i'm bringing in the wolf which is the benjamin all of these forming the same group the worker group during the tribulation okay so the first thing that i want to do is just discuss about wolves in general there's a lot that we can actually say about them but um, they also have an alpha wolf like we have our alpha and omega they have an alpha wolf they also have alpha females they mate for life. They are very, the alpha wolf is very protective over the pack. They usually stand high on a mountain or a hill overlooking the pack to protect it. And they, um, um, they are fierce hunters, very ravenous. They fight to the death and they are willing to give their life for the pack. So these are warrior animals, if I can say anything else. They are definitely warrior animals and they, um, uh, they're all about the pack. They're all about the family, so to speak. Okay, so definitely not to be messed with. Um, they also come from the dog family right or dogs come from wolves we put it rather that way and in scripture dogs are have different meanings um, when the lady sat at Yeshua's table and uh, she was a Samaritan mm -hmm. she he asked her what does he have to do with her and she said that even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table and what she meant with that is even the Gentiles so dogs are related to Gentiles um, dogs are also in scripture male prostitutes very important to see that they are male prostitutes and um, dogs are um, also um, a, with a reference to hounds of hell they represent demons as well demons that attack us if you go to my devotional teaching called two johns and a jezebel you uh, i discuss a dream in there that's got dogs a black dog in it as well um, and just the reference to the the enemy how he attacks through dogs and wolves very interesting dream in there as well that's related to this um, let me see. Also, um, when we think of wolves, we think of false prophets and false teachers. That's the reference to dogs or wolves. 
and then dogs we also know is known as man's best friend so a lot of times people will uh, tell me i've had this in this dream could you please interpret it for me and it will have a dog in and very often than not it is a representation of a friend in their life or meaning friendship and john the baptist was known as the friend of the bridegroom okay very important we remember that so going to benjamin let's let's read about about benjamin now in um, deuteronomy and in genesis genesis jacob uh, speaks a blessing over his children and um, in deuteronomy moses speaks a blessing over the tribe so there's two blessings for each tribe so to speak so let's go to the first one um, of deuteronomy uh, and that is in 33 deuteronomy 33 i'm going to go to that one first hear what moses said Thirty-three, verse twelve. Okay, so this is what Moses is speaking over uh, uh, Benjamin, and it's important that you note just before he speaks over uh, Benjamin, or in this case, he first speaks about Benjamin, and right after that, he speaks a blessing over Joseph. So you always find Benjamin and Joseph mentioned together. So in verse 12, this is what Moses says over Benjamin. And Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him. And the Lord shall cover him all the day long and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Now, shoulders is a reference to uh, government. It's a reference to government of ruling and reigning. Just like Joseph ruled and reigned at the end. So he is, I can almost see him being carried on the shoulders of God in the back, being strapped between his shoulders in his government. Okay, just like John, the, uh, the revelator or John the disciple was also known as the beloved. Yeah, Benjamin is also known as the beloved. And John laid with his heart on Yeshua's bosom. So they both speak of intimacy and authority. Okay. The, let's go to Jacob's blessing that he spoke of. That's in uh, Genesis 49, verse 27. Okay. In this case, uh, let me just see. Joseph was blessed first and Benjamin after him. Once again, they are seen together. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. So you see here that Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, were known as warriors and they devoured. They were ravenous wolves. They've got a, a bad... Uh, part in history as well but they were warriors okay now we're going to go to joseph and how joseph reacted towards benjamin and this is very important that we understand that that's in chapter 43 of genesis in verse 30 Remember, we are the Benjamins. This is the point I'm bringing across. We are the ravenous wolves in this time against the wolves of the enemy. Okay, verse 30. And Joseph, let's read from verse 29. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. 
And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. So Joseph, when he saw his brother, was so moved within his bowels that he yearned for him. So this um, deeply, this move, being moved, it means to be deeply affected with passion, love and yearning. And the bowels means his womb, literally womb, which is a tender love as cherishing a fetus. You can you imagine a mother or a father, how they cherish a fetus within the womb. That is the kind of love he has for his Benjamins. Okay. And as I say, the Benjamins and the Joseph is inseparable. They're always together. Where Yeshua was, you would find John. They were always together. Okay. So facts, some facts about Benjamin is that he, his name means beloved son. In the same way, John was known as the beloved. Um, he's also known as the son of pain because Rachel gave birth to him in pain. Um, but that pain means tribulation. Okay, so think of the tribulation of travail. He's also known as the son of my right hand. We know the queen of the south. In Psalm 45, we talk about the queen. She stands at the right hand of the king. And that right hand means south. And here, the son of my right hand also means son of the south. You can see the connection there as well. And another thing about all Benjamin's sons is that I think he had 10 sons. One of his sons, all of his sons had a name that referred to Joseph, that had something to do with Joseph. That's how much Joseph, uh, um, Benjamin loved Joseph, whom he never knew. Okay, And one of his sons was called the one whose wedding I never saw. I find that quite interesting. Okay, so there you have the whole context with regards to um, Benjamin and the wolf and the connection, connection with Joseph. Now you can see here that we've got this little girl in the painting as well and I said earlier I knew exactly what that meant. Now what she, if I would give her a name I would probably call her Lily because what she represents is guilelessness and for that reason you can understand why father um, in two Johns and a Jezebel, I speak a bit about being without guile. So this is a reference to that. Now, children are innocent. They are pure and they are virginal. That is what that speaks about. Okay. So she's dressed in white and she's a child. And being innocent is also connected with a dove. And in Song of Solomon, the bride is called my dove. Actually, the bride and the bridegroom is called my dove okay so it's got to do with innocence and it's got to do with purity she's got red shoes on i don't know if you can see that she's got red shoes on and that speaks of uh, a sanctified walk she's been sanctified and set apart and then you see the scroll now the scroll is a reference to ezekiel 2 where ezekiel was told after he received a scroll that he must eat it and what was written above and below on the scroll was lamentations, mournings and woes. Now that lamentations, mournings and woes speaks of the whole of the tribulation. It has to be eaten. Remember if you go to part one of the spirit of Elijah, I talk about the fact that those who judge have been judged. Those who can call down fire has gone through the fire. So this scroll, Ezekiel was told to eat. In the same way, they receive a scroll written on it, Lamentations, Mornings and Woes. Now Lamentations, the book of Lamentations, is about the destruction of Jerusalem. So that talks about that. Mornings talks about the seals period where there will be all the calamities of nature, financially, wars, <clears throat> and everything that happens with that, the persecution. Those are the mourning periods, a lot of deaths. And then we find the trumpet period, 
where, which is a representation of the woes where the bowls are being uh, poured out. When you read in the book of Revelations, you hear about the woes at the last trumpets. Okay, so that is what that scroll is. So they will receive the scroll, so to speak, to eat and be during the tribulation year in order to speak that judgment because they've already allowed God to judge them. Now you can understand the fierceness of the wolf, the ravenous wolf part that is in conjunction with this innocence being made pure and set apart unto God. Because this is the disposition of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah is twofold. It is both the innocence and humility and purity of heart, meekness, which is the opposite spirit of Jezebel, which is pride, uh, a, a religious spirit, and uh, a, a rebellious spirit, promiscuous as well. So it's a completely different spirit that they walk in. But where Jezebel is as a wolf and is as uh, with all her false prophets and teachers, which are wolves, so the bride rising up at the same time, that queen of the south, that Benjamin, will be also as ravenous because you, the, 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 the sheep cannot protect themselves, like I said in the previous devotional, cannot protect themselves against a wolf. They need the shepherds to be as wolves against these wolves, to come against them. Okay, so this is the disposition. That which you see there is a representation of the spirit of Elijah. Okay, that God is working in us. So we find two Johns in scripture and we find two Josephs. Okay, I'll explain what I mean. And two Johns, for instance, we have um, uh, 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 in John 1, we have Nathaniel right at the end of John 1. We have Nathaniel where Yeshua comes to him and sees him for the first time. And well, he said he saw him under the fig tree, but he sees him and he says to him, Behold an Israelite in whom is no guile. So he is guileless. He's innocent like Lily. Okay, he's innocent. So Nathaniel is innocent and guileless. Then we have in Revelations 14 where it talks about the virgins, a virgin, where they are with their mouth are without guile and they have not fornicated with women. That woman means, uh, 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 or it's not women, they have not fornicated. I think it's with women. But the point is, it, it, it's a reference, those virgins, oh yeah, it's not fornicated with women because the woman represents the world. Okay, represents Jezebel in a way. Um, and virgins there is both male and female. So the Revelation 14 guileless ones are virgins. They are the 144,000. And their representation is Philip that we find in Acts 13 that had four daughters that were prophetesses. Then we have the Nathaniel, who is without guile, so he is the 144,000 of seals. So you have a seal period with 144,000, and you have a trumpet period with 144,000. One is Nathaniel, the other one is Philip. You will note that Philip is the one that brought Nathaniel to Yeshua. So the two were together. In the beginning. So Nathaniel was brought to Yeshua in the same way that Benjamin was brought by his brothers to Joseph. And it is interesting that Philip told Nathaniel, because Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay. And Philip said to him, come and meet him. Um, and he says that he is the son of Joseph. Okay, so I said we've got two Josephs as well. So here it was talking about his genealogy of his earthly father being Joseph. But this is also a reference to Acts 2. Why is a reference to Acts 2? Because when Peter 
came out after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He told the people, These are, uh, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel, saying that there will be dreams and visions. What was Joseph known for? Dreams and visions. Okay, so here we have the son of Joseph meeting up with Benjamin. Okay, and Benjamin was brought in just like the story of Joseph himself. And we find that where in, when Yeshua was born, his father, Joseph, placed him into a manger in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a place of birth, right? And when he was buried in a tomb, the tomb belonged to a man called Joseph as well. And the tomb is a representation of death and resurrection. Not just death, but death and resurrection. So you find a Joseph in the beginning, you find a Joseph in the end. Joseph, in the story of Joseph, Joseph ruled and reigned second in command next to Pharaoh over Egypt. Egypt is a type and shadow of this world. So he will be the last as well. So he's the first and the last. Joseph is the first and the last. Um, the same with the Smyrna group. They are first sent out, but they will rule and reign at the last when they are raised up from the dead. The first and the last. And you will see now what I mean with that um, when we go to another scripture. Okay, let me see if I left everything out, anything out. I think I, I said what needed to be said. So during this week, I had a dream. Um, actually, it was just before Father started this devotional teaching with me. I had a dream and I kept on thinking in this dream. I can't remember what I said in the dream, but I was teaching people about the number 27, 28 and 29. The whole time, these numbers were just in my head the whole time until I woke up and I realized, OK, I need to look up 27, 28 and 29. And this is what it means. Just once again, Father's confirmation um, in what he is showing me. So the number, let's go. I'm going to start from 29, then 28, then 27. 29 means my father is Yah. 28 means my father takes knowledge. And 27 means beloved, my father is judge, a prince of Benjamin. Just amazing. So if we're going to put that together from 29, 28, 27, we're going to read it as follows. Yah, my father takes knowledge and will judge through his beloved Benjamin. Okay. So, I want to talk about the wolf connection between John the Baptist and, mm -hmm. and Benjamin, and, and where that comes in. Also remembering the, the vision that the lady saw of me, where I was as a wolf with my teeth. Okay, so for that we're going to go to Isaiah 41. And we're going to read from verse 14. 14 to 16. Actually, let's read from verse 8. Um, because this is actually speaking of John the Baptist. Now, I'll uh, uh, confirm this in, in Luke. Uh, Isaiah 41 verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abram, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with my right hand of righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. Remember, we're going to be hated by all men. And they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, 
I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Listen to this blessing of verse 15. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water, and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitter tree, the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree, and the pine, and the box tree together. Trees are representations of man, the man that Yeshua uh, healed of blindness. He at first, he didn't see clearly, and he said he saw men walking around as trees. Okay, Verse 20, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. So it says here in verse 15 that he's going to make him a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Okay, And what he will do with his teeth is that he will thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. So let's go to Luke 3 when it talks about John the Baptist. Luke 3 verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah as the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness... Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. In verse 17, um, it says here, John answered, saying unto them, All I indeed baptize you with water, but one mighty then cometh, that latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Remember, he comes, Elijah is that which comes with fire. Okay. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquestionable. So we find here that here Elijah is, is the one that is breaking down the mountains and the hills. And the baptizer in fire, being Yeshua, he is fanning his flame, working together with the Elijah group. And we know that Jezebel was destroyed. Her works were destroyed with fire because the God of fire answered. And that's why when we look to the, read in the book of Revelations 2 about the church of Thyatira, he comes with fire in his eyes talking about Jezebel. So you have to connect fire with Elijah and Jezebel. And there you can see the connection with the teeth and bringing down the mountains. Okay. So the other day, I was um, I was just overwhelmed by the just the understanding of the call upon my life. You know, I I just sat and I thought about the responsibility of the fact that I am I'm speaking to people that some will actually give their lives and lay their lives down and be martyrs, and some will be cast into prison and. And, and, and what Father has called me is to prepare the worker bride, to, to endure to the end. And that's too, that's too much for me to take in, really. Uh, uh, and I was just sitting 
and thinking about this and it and it truly overwhelmed me and at that moment he reminded me of a message that somebody emailed me um, when I left the, the forum that I was involved with and this person said to me uh, in this message he said to me that he sees me as, uh, let me see, a warrior spirit woman. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of that. And uh, at that moment when I was just overwhelmed by all of this, um, and because I didn't feel like that at all at that moment, I just felt very small. And I went to look it up again, what he wrote, and I remembered that he sent me a video. And so he said to me that I am this warrior spirit woman. And that he will always be my friend. And then the video that he sent me, I understood why Father wanted me to go there. Because the video was called, this was an extract from Dances with Wolves. <laughs> go figure. So in it, it was about, the extract was about this friend, one of the warriors that we know Kevin Costner plays in it. And um, this warrior uh, was greeting him when he left. Uh, he has Kevin Costner. He's on his horse with this woman that he fell in love with. They're now leaving everybody. And she's walking next to him. And this uh, warrior is high on a hill looking down on them. And he shouts a greeting. It's one of the most emotional parts of that uh, video or that movie. And this is the, 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 what he is saying to them. He's saying this. And this is what the Holy Spirit was saying to me. This is why he wanted me to watch it, because he wanted me to understand this is what he is saying to the Benjamins. Okay. He said, um, Dances with Wolves, because that's what Kevin Costner was called, because what happened is they saw that there's this one wolf that followed him wherever he went, just like the virgins follows the, the lamb wherever he goes. So there was this one wolf following him wherever he went, two white socks. And um, they saw him running around and playing with this wolf. So they called him Dancers with Wolves. So here's this warrior calling him. And the warrior's called, name is called Wind in His Hair. And this is what he says to him. He says to him, Dancers with Wolves. I am wind in his hair. Do you see that I am your friend? Can you see that you will always be my friend? That's what he was saying. So I did a bit of thinking about this whole scenario, of this Dances the Wolf extract that he sent me. And um, wind in his hair is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Because Yeshua told Nicodemus in John 3, he said to him that the spirit moveth and nobody knows, just like the wind, where it comes from. So wind in his hair is an, a, a type and shadow um, of the Holy Spirit. Not that the makers of the video meant that. It's just the way Father showed me now. This is what I want to show you. Dances with Wolves, Kevin Costner, which is Dances with Wolves, is he's the Joseph that dances with the wolves, with these Benjamins, right? Now, the woman next to him is his bride. And her name is Lakota, right? She is that wolf that he dances with, so to speak. And I looked up the name for Lakota and I couldn't find it, but I, I found out that it, the Lakota is Native Americans that is in North and South Dakota. And so I couldn't find the meaning of Lakota, but I found the meaning of Dakota. And Dakota means friend, ally, and forever smiling. And then I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to look up the meaning of Kevin Costner's name, Kevin. And Kevin means comely, beloved, and handsome. That most definitely sounds like Solomon in the Song of Songs. And in Luke 11, Yeshua says that he is here as greater as than Solomon with his queen. So you see this whole connection. But what Father wanted me to understand, yes, it's overwhelming the responsibility, yes, but I want you to know. My Holy Spirit is with you, and you are in me, and I in you, and my Spirit is in you, and we are friends. And John the Baptist is known as the friend of the bridegroom. That's just so special. Okay, so that is part one of this devotional teaching with regards to the wolf, why I'm connecting 
uh, John the Baptist, Elijah, Smyrna, Queen of the South, with Benjamin. Okay, so this ravenous part of it. Now we're going to find out why. Why do they need to be ravenous? And for that, we're going to deal with um, the doctrine of Jezebel. Okay, so in the first devotional, the, the part one of the spirit of Elijah, I was talking about how Ahab and Jezebel comes to uh, go together, just like Herod and his adulterous wife, actually his brother's wife, um, how they come together. And then I mentioned that the church of Pergamos, we have a representation of the Antichrist because it talks about Satan's seat. A seat speaks of government. government talks about Satan's seat and then right after that we have the church of Thyatira and it sp speaks of Jezebel the false prophet or prophetess which is a representation of the false prophet so we have the antichrist and the false prophet we have uh, Ahab which was known as the most wicked king ever and we have Jezebel with him we have Herod a king and we have this adulterous woman so you see the connection, how they go together. Okay, so let's go to Luke's discourse in Luke 11. And we're going to read from verse 45 to 51, I think. Let's read here. Luke 11 from verse 45. Okay, so just before this conversation or what is going to be read here now, um, the Pharisees was giving Yeshua a difficult time and he called them a brood of vipers and all those things. So let's read what he's now going to say. Then answered one of the lawyers, now lawyers are speaking to him, and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproaches us also. He's saying you are not speaking well of us. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers. For ye laid men with burdens grievous to born, and ye yourself touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. In other words, you're not preaching, doing what you preach. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets. You build the graves of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly, ye bear witness that you allow the deeds of your fathers. In other words, you agree with your fathers. For they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. Curs. Therefore also said the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is a reference to the Holy Spirit as well, right? I will send them prophets and apostles. Who is being sent out at the beginning? Apostles and prophets. And some of them they shall slay and persecute. Yeshua said some will go to prison and some will die. That the blood of all the prophets which were shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. What generation? This generation that we are in. The blood of all the prophets from the foundation of this world. That is how God feels about his prophets, about his friends. Okay, True prophets, that is. 51. From the blood of Abel, Unto the blood of Zacharias, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. Okay, so he's talking against the lawyers, and he's talking against the Pharisees. The lawyers represent the law, right? The Pharisees represent traditions of men. So he's saying that, you know, he, uh, 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 they, they bind people with their law and their traditions. Okay, But now we need to understand that we are now reading about the discourse. Um, you and I are now not under the law and we, we don't have the traditions of the Pharisees. So how does this play out in the time to come? So... I will elaborate on that a bit further. Okay. And also, it says that the blood of the, the prophets will be required of this generation. We read in Revelation 17 where the, the harlot Jezebel writes the beast that she is drunk with the blood of the saints. So there will be a payday, so to speak. 
Okay, so we're talking about the spirit of Elijah, this ravenous wolf, this wolf coming against the spirit of, 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 of uh, God's judgment um, spoken through his prophets as a ravenous wolf, but them also walking in that spirit of humility and meekness, the opposite spirit of Jezebel, coming against the, the, the spirit of Jezebel in the time to come. So whilst during this week my father was talking to me about all of this, this one morning I woke up and I clearly heard 1 Peter 5 and I had to go and read 1 Peter 5 and this is what father wanted my attention to draw my attention to. So let's go to that. We're going to read 1 Peter 5 from verse 1 to 4. Okay, so here John is talking to the elders. The ach John, Peter is talking to the elders. He's saying, "Yeah, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder." So he's saying, "I'm also an elder, but I'm speaking to you, elders, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed." Okay, he's now giving them instruction. He's saying to them. Feed the flock of God which is amongst you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, the elders are shepherds, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Okay, so he's speaking to the elders here. They are the shepherds of the flock. Uh, Peter was told by Yeshua, uh, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. The shepherds feed the flock. Here he's speaking to the elders. He's telling them to feed the flock. So the elders are the shepherds. This is why he's saying that when the chief shepherd comes, the one that are over the shepherds, who are the shepherds? The fivefold ministry. Psalm 144 of the previous devotion, I discussed it, where David says that the Lord teaches his hand to war and his fingers to make war. The hand is a representation of the fivefold ministry, the shepherds. That look after the children. And then I mentioned or discussed later on in Psalm 144. That he says, David says that the sons may be as plants and the daughters as cornerstones. The plants are terebinths. They are pillars. The cornerstones are also pillars. Now James, John and Peter are known are as the pillars of faith. So what is the responsibility of the elders? It's to make their children as pillars. To make of them apostles and prophets and teachers and, and all those of the fivefold ministry. That they will grow up in stature, that they will be established and strong, that they they character will endure, that they will protect them from deception, that they will grow in Christ and Christ may be formed in them. This is the responsibility of the pillars of the elders to create pillars. You know, if, if you want those who follow you to even exceed you, that God would bless them so much that they, they, the favor on God would be more than even on you. That should be the heart of a pastor, of a shepherd at least. Okay, so the word elders means a term of rank or office, and it's the shepherds like I just mentioned here, and um, a pillar, okay, a pillar is a terebinth, okay, it's an oak tree that is fire resistant, 
and it means foster father and mother. That is what a pillar means in the Strong's Concordance. It's a foster mother and father. Okay, and they are responsible to look after the children. So we know the term also of heavy shepherding that has gone, you know, I don't know if it's still very much applicable, probably still is, but it's got to do with um, controlling, manipulating um, through your office. Um, and, and for filthy lucre um, that Peter spoke about, he is here speaking about um, for greed, for a dishonest gain. Where the greed can be to also to build yourself up on a pedestal to be worshipped. Um, not just financially, but it can mean financially as well. So he's, he's exhorting the elders to really look after them. Okay, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 4, I mean, verse 15. This is what 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 says. It says, For though you have 10,000 instructors, instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He says, I've birthed you through the gospel. He's saying, I'm your father. Okay, But you have many instructors, but you don't have any fathers or many fathers. Now that word instructor is actually a word that they used for the slaves that were uh, responsible to look after the sons and daughters of a family. And they were like almost like their guardians and they would tutor them. These slaves were responsible to tutor the, the master's children. Those are the instructors. But Peter is saying you actually need fathers and mothers, so to speak. Okay, so a father, we go into the strongest meaning of 1 Corinthians 4. Fathers is one who stands in a father's place and looks after another in a paternal way. It's also a title of honor and it means teachers as those to whom pupils trace back the knowledge and training they have received. And another word for these fathers are apostles. Okay, so the fivefold ministry, these are the pillars. And if you look at it, they almost look like pillars, your fingers, right? They are the pillars, apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and pastor. They are shepherds. They are pillars. Okay, so foster mothers and fathers. And if you think of it, God's order is that um, women will look after women, men will look after men. It's not good for a woman to uh, uh, be in a, a long-standing mentoring relationship with a man. It's okay if we give advice. You know, Deborah gave advice as a judge. She was the mother of the nation. She, Everybody came to her for wisdom and guidance. But a personal relationship, that must be between a man and a man, a woman with a woman. Okay, we need to protect ourselves. The enemy is very cunning. He knows what he's doing. Okay, so in Acts 13, we find the first apostolic sending. So let's go to Acts 13. Actually, we don't have to go there. What I just want to say in Acts 13 is that we, we have them in Antioch. The first verse says, now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Okay, And then the Holy Ghost told them to separate unto them Barnabas and Saul. And this happened after they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them. Then they were sent away. Now the word apostle means to be sent. Okay. So what happened is here they're in this church and the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to set apart these people to go out after fasting and praying, laying their hands on them and blessing them. So apostles are sent out, but before they be sent out, they have to grow up in maturity and be established. And that's the interesting part about um, 1 Peter 5, is that it talks about uh, 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 how the elders must not 
must be willing to look after the flock. They must have a willing mind. They, they, uh, um, they mustn't practice lordship over them. They must feed them. They must not be out of constraint. In other words, you mustn't do it because you're forced and you've got no choice, but because you have counted the cost of what it means to look after the flock in this time that will come. You've actually counted the cost of what you will face. Willingly, voluntarily, you must consent to being what I've called you to. You must be willing to pay the price. And um, it says to have a ready mind. That is G4290. And it means a forward in spirit, fierceness, predisposed. In other words, determined, focused, and not playing any games with anybody. So that's a type of father and mother. Father and mothers, they can be like this. They are loving and soft and caring, but at the same time, they can be strict. And the Lord actually took me to watch a video of an a alpha female wolf to see how she growls at her little ones. And man, it looks like she's going to eat them up. She, that teeth, vicious, how she growls at them. And the reason why she growled at them in this video was because she wanted them to become independent of her. And they didn't want to. They want to be with their mommy. Um, and that's the way she growled at them. To get them to stay away from them, from her so that they can grow independently. A pillar stands independently. A pillar stands alone. Leaders stand alone. They have people under them. Okay? So we are to create pillars. Now this is what he tells them in 1 Peter 5. Right after he speaks to the elders, he speaks to those under the elders, the flock, and tell them to be submissive and humble towards one another. And he ends it off by saying to them that uh, once they have suffered, they have to endure it because once they have suffered, then they, the Lord will perfect them and establish them. And that word establish means to be secure, means to be set, it means to be firm, it means to be a pillar. So, exactly like Psalm 144, the influence of those elders in how they are like this will cause those flock, those sheep to become pillars as well. That's not going to be easy. That's really not going to be easy in the time to come because of the challenges that we will face. Okay. That word, to be subject to one another, is the word... Um, Hupo Tasso, and it's from G5293, and it, it's, it's in the strong says the following, it's a Greek military term meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military function under the command of a leader. In a non-military use, which is applicable to us, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating Assuming responsibility and carrying a burden. So it's coming as a unit and submitting in love to one another. Submitting to the voice of Yeshua through the elders. To be able to recognize his voice. The sheep knows his voice even if that voice has to come through an elder. And then submit to one another. Be willing to cooperate. It's a complete different spirit than the spirit of Jezebel. That's pride and rebellion and, and uh, uh, contentious and religious. So that's the spirit that needs to be fostered in this time. Okay. So the responsibility of the apostles and the prophets sent out in this time will be to take oversight. Okay, just like 1 Peter 5 says, and that means to be aware and to inspect. What will they have to inspect? False doctrine. They have to be voluntary serve and minister in humility. And the third one is to be a ready mind, which means to be strict. They have to be strict. So why do we need to be like wolves? Because sheep cannot protect themselves against wolves. The elders will have to be like that. Okay. So we're going to go against false doctrine. 
You know, Yeshua said that we are sent as sheep for the slaughter amongst wolves. And what he meant there was not false doctrine in that scripture in Luke 11. What he meant there was persecution. Okay, I just want to make the difference there. So now I'm going to read a dream that my friend sent me, Chantal, um, that she had that holds hands with this and the responsibility that will be with us. Okay, so this is her dream. She dreamed that she was on an island and it's a place of safety and they grew their own food. She knew that she was in control of this island and there was a small control center, not a high building, at a landing strip for small aeroplanes. The planes would come in to bring supplies and she also saw tables or stations set out to receive the supplies. A plane was coming in, which they did not expect at all. And it landed for about two minutes and started to fly again and it turned upside down and turned back to land again. They were not expecting this plane. And when she came to the pilot, still sitting in the plane, she saw that the window was opened as one would do with a car window. So roll it down, going down. So the pilot was the king of Saudi Arabia and she knew he was very evil. That would be an Arab king. Right, So he looked at her and told her that he wants her and that she was going to look after his children. He had an AK-47 rifle with him. He shot at her, but only around her feet and said, I'm coming to get you. Then she says that even though she knew there were other people as well, she only saw him. And these other people with him started to execute everyone on the idol island in rows they were standing in rows the next moment they are on a speedboat and all the children are tied to the boat on the river or on the water hanging on onto water tubes so here's the speedboat she's on the speedboat with this guy this arab king and children are tied to the speedboat hanging on to water tubes chantal was very concerned for these children and one child fell off she was in the sea trying to find this child in the waves. She could see that he was bloated, although not dead. He was badly injured and she just wanted this child to get to the hospital. The next moment the scene changes. and She's walking to a building with bare feet on thorns. Somebody came and took her to the building still on the island. She calls her mother for help saying that they are planning to kidnap her. And she will never see her mom again. And in this dream, Chantal was, um, had long, beautiful hair and her feet was bare. She also previously shared a dream with me where she was also in a shopping mall with the most beautiful long hair and bare feet. Okay, quite a dream. So this is the interpretation of the dream. Chantal's long hair speaks of the glory of the Lord on her. In scripture, a woman's hair is her glory. So it talks that she's an apostle here, the bride, an apostle. And the glory of the Lord is upon her, that acts to outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. Her bare feet speaks of walking in humility. The thorns are those thorns mentioned in my previous diva, where the Son of Man... Okay, will find himself amongst thorns, briars, and scorpions. That is in the Prophets Amongst Us video where I talk about that they will not listen to what we have to say. So it refers to the slander, the thorns to, and the scorpions refers to the slander and verbal assault on those apostles and prophets sent out. Okay, it will hurt. Her feet was bleeding. The island speaks of a designated area that she has control over. She is in control of the control center. So, you know, if you go to a church, an elder is sent to a church, or apostle or prophet sent to a church during the time to come, that is your designated area. You have control, you're in control, you're an elder. Okay. Um, the airplane speaks of that which the enemy tries to bring into the church via false prophets and false teachers. They are his prophets who sits at the table of Jezebel and deceive the children of God. The king of Saudi Arabia speaks of the Antichrist. Noah first let the raven out and then the dove. The dove speaks of the Holy Spirit outpouring and the raven in the Strong's concordance means Arab. The word raven there means Arab. 
The raven speaks of the Antichrist. So the timing of the tribulation is shown here during which the Antichrist will be here persecuting the saints. The men with him killing the, and assassinating the people speak of the beheading and persecution of the saints. And interestingly enough, beheadings take place in Saudi Arabia, which is what will happen to those who refuse to take the mark of the beast. The win window going down slowly of the, the uh, airplane is uh, like a car window, speaks of revelation. So here's the Antichrist and the window is going down. So it's like revealing who it is. It's a time when the Antichrist will clearly be revealed to the saints. They will know who he is. They will know it's him. He wants her, which is to say he is after those sent by God. The apostles will be hated by all men. Just like Ahab and Jezebel went after the prophets. The AK-47 okay, are A is number 1 and K is number 16 and then 47. So if you put it together, you've got 116 plus 47. Strong's 116 means Athens. Okay? Um, this is a reference to being sent to the marketplace. Also mentioned in my previous dream in the apostolic sending where I was talking about Paul going to Athens. It refers to apostolic sending. The 47 means valiant and mighty. So he is got this uh, uh, AK-47 and he's shooting at her. The plane turning upside down is the twisting of scripture. The supplies being brought in and children she now has to look after are those he is holding captive, being tied to the speedboat. They are holding onto water tubes which is filled with wind. Water tubes is filled with wind. This refers to being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, the children. The sea speaks of the word of God. Okay, the sea, water, the word of God. But they are holding for dear life onto the tubes. The child also rescued, which is bloated, points to pride. Because pride puffeth up. The enemy is very much into child trafficking. And he does this by a false prophet and false teachers. Okay, child trafficking. Let's go to 2 Peter 2. Okay, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought thee, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their promiscuous ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken, spoken evil of. And through covetousness, remember, the elders were told not to uh, feed the flock through filthy lucre, through greed. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. They will make merchandise of you. Now what does this mean? Make merchandise means to go on, go a trading, to travel for business, to traffic, to trade, of a thing to import for sale, to deal in, to use a person or a thing for gain. Think of child trafficking. What? Why are children trafficked? It's to make them prostitutes. What is Jezebel known as? The mother of harlots. This is what the false doctrine of Jezebel does. It makes them harlots. Okay. So let's go to the doctrine of Jezebel. We read that in Revelation 17 from verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Not because he admired her, he was just like, couldn't believe what he was seeing. So she wears purple, right? And we remember that the church of Thyatira is a reference to Lydia in Acts, 16, I think, or 17. 
Lydia was a seller of purple and she was from Thyatira. Okay, so here Jezebel is wearing purple, but purple is also linked to priesthood. So purple is tribulation, but it's also priesthood. And a priest, in this case, she's called a false prophetess, representation of the false prophet. Okay, she's riding on the beast. Okay, so the beast is not just the Antichrist, because Jezebel and the Antichrist go together, like Ahab and Jezebel. But the beast is also a system. Okay, it's a system that is made of, it's governmental, it's religious, and it's financial, the one world order. So when you worship the beast, you worship the system. You are bowing down in submission to the system. That's the doctrine of Jezebel. Okay. And the doctrine finds its manifestation through the turning around. The plane was turned around. It twisted. It's twisting scripture. It's twisting truth. Through the fact that we have now where the, the divine feminine, the rise of the divine feminine is taking place, which is the Jezebel spirit. Where we have that, that the women are seeking equality. We have the rise of the feminist movement. We have the LGBTQ alphabet um, rights. We have the Satanists wanting to be acknowledged as a religion. Um, we and have been we we have rights to abortion that being fought all of, of of these are the rise of this divine feminine where rights are being fought for okay and so what we have is where god's order is man woman and children we have her rising up above the man even though she says she's seeking equality and we have the woman then the man then the children and sometimes it's the man last that matter in some households so we have this rise of this rebellious religious spirit that is in opposition we have the worship of the mother god versus the worship of the father god and and jezebel comes in different forms and that's why the lord has determined that with the rise of the queen of heaven of the mother of harlots we have the the rise of the queen of the south in Luke 11, the, the, the mother of virgins, virgins. And, and, and that these opposing spirits, the one humble, the one prideful, will come against each other like ravenous wolves and God will answer with fire because they will speak fire over these false doctrines, over these false teachers and false prophets. Huge responsibility. Huge, it's, it's, it's unimaginable, but with God's power, because he is our friend. Okay, so harlotry, she, is, she makes children of harlots, and harlots have, uh, harlotry has three things in common. Idolatry, fornication, and adultery. Remember, um, Herod's uh, 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 woman, not his wife even, she was her, his brother's wife. So it's adulterous relationship. So it's idolatry, fornication, and adultery. So if you go to the Church of Pergamos in Revelation 2, let's read there. First, we're going to read now about the uh, doctrine of Baal. Okay, verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. Satan's seat, Antichrist, is ruling. And has not hold fast my name. What does that mean? They have not taken the name, worship the name of the beast. They have hold fast the name of the father. What's the name of the beast? Well, there's many names. Okay. And has not denied my faith. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, beheadings, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed 
unto idols and to commit fornication. So there you have the idolatry and the fornication. So as thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, I don't know if you remember, but the church of Ephesus was told that they were fighting against those who are false apostles and who are the Nicolaitans. Here we have that in Pergamos, and they have accepted it. So you see the spiritual decline of the church during this time. Okay. So Satan's seat here is the Antichrist reigning. Holding fast unto his name is versus the name of Yeshua, okay, Lord God. Faithful martyr is talking about the beheadings. And this points to Ahab, okay, who was the most wicked king. The Antichrist is a king, he's a ruler in this time. Most definitely the most wicked. Okay. The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine of Baal. And what is Baal? Baal is an ox, it's a beast. Okay. And they were eating things sacrificed unto idols and they were committing fornication. Now, Baal means lord or master. Heavy shepherding for that matter. Um, but it means lord or master. And in spirit, uh, uh, in it's a spirit of rebellion. So in Revelation 13, we have the mark of the beast. And the number 13 means rebellion. It is a connection to rebellion. Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, is what Alistair Crowley said, the uh, founder of the first Satanist church, church or church of Satan. Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. It's talking about anarchy. It's talking about being your own God. You choose what you want to do. Okay. So what did the prophets of Baal do in 1 Kings 17? They ate at the table of Jezebel. That is a reference to the idols or the sacrifice uh, 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 being eaten that was, or the food being sacrificed unto idols that they were eating. They were eating at Jezebel's table. Okay, so food, when you eat in those times, when you ate with somebody, you were in having communion with them. You were breaking bread. That means you are in friendship with them. And friendship in those times meant covenant. So when the prophets of Baal are sitting at Jezebel's table, they are fornicating with her. They becoming one because that's what covenant means. It means I become one with you. So they are fornicating with Jezebel, eating from her table. Ultimately what it means is that they are breaking covenant with God. Okay. This is why this is so serious. Okay, So they are committing fornication. Yeshua says, or uh, uh, Paul says in, in Corinthians, he said, Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Can you make the temple of the Holy Spirit one with a prostitute with a harlot? This is a reference to this. It's the wrong doctrine. Okay. So to eat a table at a table means to be in communion and to eat at Baal's table, you are breaking covenant. So the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is the doctrine of Baal. Okay. Um, and the word Nicolaitans means the destruction of people. This is how serious it is in the time to come. The system and how the people will be given in to want to give in due to the pressure. The church will want to give in. And the apostles and prophets, the elders, are sent out to these churches to deal with these issues. And they have to deal with it as, with, as ravenous wolves. But also in the spirit of humility, meekness and love. Okay. Revelations 2. Now we're going to read about Thyatira. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, talking to the church of Thyatira. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So it's the same system. It's Baal. It's the doctrine of Baal is the doctrine of Jezebel. Okay. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So they, they are committing adultery. Once again, the children of harlots, right, 
Harlotry is idolatry, fornication, and adultery. You can do this in a mean this in a literal sense when you idolize something, anything that controls you. Uh, 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 is a master of you if sin uh, uh, is your master it, or controls you it's your master it's an idol fornication literal fornication adultery literal adultery but spiritual fornication idolatry and adultery is that of giving into the system in this case in this context of the time that we are going in um, verse 23 and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So in Pergamos, we have the Antichrist um, at Satan's seat, which is the Ahab figure. In Thyatira, we have Jezebel as the false prophet, always going together. Just like the, the Benjamins always go with the Joseph. The innocent ones. Okay. So she seduces the servants. Over and over in the Old Testament, whenever God told the, the usually the prophets to uh, and uh, the Israelites to go and destroy the altars of, of, of uh, 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 Jezebel or the enemy or whoever it may be, they had to go to the mountains, to the hills. Okay, where there would be these uh, Asheroth poles. Um, we know them as obelisks and they're basically male phalluses. That's what they are. And they would, uh, uh, they would obviously do uh, 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 idolatrous uh, uh, idol worship there, but it was obviously also fornication and promiscuity uh, that happened in those places, in those high places where they drew powers from. So... God sent the Israelites there to go there and what they would have to do is they would have to axe them down because they were made of wood and then they would burn them up. Now, earlier I mentioned that John, um, John the Baptist, the Elijah, that with his teeth he will bring down the mountains and the hills. But the other interesting he said also in Luke 3 is that, let's read that, what John the Baptist told the Pharisees when they came to him. He said, Verse 7 in Luke 3, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits thereof worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abram to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abram, through faith and not works, right? That's what he means. Verse 9, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. He is now speaking about their idolatry. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is a reference to this idolatry, fornication, and adultery. Remember, he spoke earlier to the lawyers representing the law and the Pharisees representing the traditions of men. Okay, so these high places were also often in groves. And groves is H842 um, and groves is a wooden area. Okay, so there's a lot of trees and it means happiness, straight, blessed and prosper. So in these groves, so this is the promise that will come, that they will, the, uh, for the church in the time to come through great revelation and poverty and fear and turmoil, that they will, you can have it easy. You can get out of this if you will just bow down, if you will bow down to the system. Okay. So other names that we have for Jezebel is Asherah, um, Astaroth, Astarte, um, Diana, uh, Mother Goddess, or Mother God, Virgin, um, Mother Mary, um, Krishna, Kali, Diana. These are all examples of, of, of Jezebel and they compose all religions, right? So what is the system? It's going to be a one world religion, one financial system and one governmental system. Okay, so... At this point, we need to understand just 
how the enemy has perfectly planned all of this for one purpose and that is full control over this whole world one purpose he has left his dominion and his is cast out of any dominion in heaven and the only dominion he can have is on this earth but the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he yeshua is lord but the enemy wants that control he wants that dominion so he's perfectly planned everything for just that one purpose he wants god's children and he wants to control them he's trafficking in them okay so let's look at the fact that this jezebel is called mystery babylon and all religions were were brought together or came out of that babylonian period right where they built the 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 the, the tower of babel and there were different languages and so they were dispersed and we find the different nationalities and different languages but at that time when they were in union as one the lord said that they are like they they see themselves as gods and nothing will be impossible for them which simply means anything goes nothing they will not stop for anything because they see themselves as god they ascended instead of humbling themselves like 1 peter 5 says they ascended and it had obviously stays because they wanted to reach heaven and this is exactly what is happening now that we even have a month called the pride month right and we have this whole agenda of this pride fighting for our rights happening at this moment ascending rising up in rebellion okay so when elijah confronted ahab he told him that he must bring all of israel and all 450 baal uh, prophets that belong to ahab and all the prophets belonging to jezebel eating at her table were 400. so i looked into the numbers ahab's prophets being 450 g 450 means to rise up against or coming against and Jezebel prophets, which is 400, the H 400 means food or meal. Think of the covenant and the fact that they ate at her table. And that food has to do with deception. Okay, G 400 of Jezebel's prophets means to cry out. And it refers to the cock crowing, which is a reference to Peter denying Christ. Okay, This is what will be happening. They will deny, the church will deny Christ. So both Ahab and Jezebel had the same fate. When Ahab died, the dogs licked up his blood. When Jezebel died, she was thrown out of a window um, between dogs and they devoured her. So uh, also in 2 Peter 2, it talks about when we return back to deception, we are like dogs returning to the vomit. Okay. So this... Um, LGBTQ uh, fighting for their rights, feminists fighting for their rights, um, people for abortion fighting for that right, Satanists uh, wanting to be accepted as a, as a religion. Um, all this woke generation, there is an agenda behind it. It's not the end in itself. Exposing the lie is not the end in itself. It is a means to the end. And so the question is, what is that end? So first of all, we've got the uh, thesis and the antithesis. We've got that, but when it explodes, when the, when the lie is exposed, we find that everybody, every nationality, every gender comes together in union to come against the lie. That in itself seems right. But what the enemy is doing through this is creating unity to come against lies. And, and the Christian is seeing as going against the stream, like salmons, going against the stream, not agreeing with this 
although they want to expose the lie, what they should do is expose the lie by wanting to expose the lie, which is what I'm doing now at this moment. Because the exposing of the lie in the way they're specifically doing it is by breaking down the, 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 the system, the authority. It's breaking down authority in order to lay a foundation for new authority. So it's breaking down the currencies. It's breaking down the, the walls of division between uh, religions, one world religion, and it is uh, 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 through wars and rumors of wars. This is also allowing the Antichrist to come in because the world will cry out for that one leader to take control. So the purpose behind the rebellion, the rising up, is for the breaking down of the present system in order to make a new system. Okay. Let's go to 1 Timothy 1. That's where the reset button comes from. It's the new world order they want to establish. 1 Timothy 1 from verse 5. or oh, sorry, from verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. In other words, they got involved with genealogies and fables, and instead of uh, uh, growing in the Lord, they just created more questions. We find this still, right? Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity, is love, out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. Faith that doesn't fade away. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. Weird word, jangling. So we have the words fables and endless uh, genealogies and jangling that they were given over to. Now this word fable means eons, which is, means ages, okay? And it refers to the gods of the ages or the beginning of ages, wanting to find out how did the earth begin? How did everything begin? What is the beginning of all things, okay? And this is where Gnosticism was born because Gnosticism, the, at the heart of it, was the question, what was first, thought or materialism? That is what they wanted to know. And the truth is, none. God was first. Not thought or materialism. God was first. In the beginning was God. And so they get involved with what was in the beginning first. Okay, They are given over to fables of, of eons of ages. And the word jangling means empty or vain talk. Think of the Tower of Babel that they were babbling. Okay, So it's confusion. It brings forth confusion. This is what this Gnosticism that's being introduced into the church, the accepting of all everybody's rights, the system that they are creating, accepting, no, uh, 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 not discriminating against anybody, everybody's on the same playing level, that kind of thing, which sounds right in the name of tolerance and love, but it's actually compromise. Right? So, this this is what they are looking for. This Gnosticism. This is what it's bringing within the church. Okay. And if you think of that they're asking what was first, the thought or materialism. The thing with thought is, is that it speaks of intellect and it speaks of knowledge. Think of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once again, a tree again, a pillar. In other words, in the garden there were two pillars. The pillar of truth and the pillar of lie. The pillar of life and the pillar of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, because trees are pillars. Okay. Um, so, I believe that the purpose for the rise of the rebellious female rival is to prepare or lay the foundation for a world where there will be no rights but will be governed by laws made by the one world order. 
So everybody's fighting for rights until it implodes, until there's no more rights. And once there's no more rights, there's only laws. Remember, Yeshua spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees. So there's, there will be no more rights. There will only be laws. And these laws will govern various groups, the haves and the have-nots. There will probably just be those two, the have and the have-nots. And it will be to control, manipulate and govern the society. So they will, you won't have a say in anything. Nothing. There will just be laws, no rights. And that's why everybody's fighting now for their rights, which will end up in there being no more rights. Okay? It will implode. Let's go to Revelation 17, verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Remember, she rides the beast. Jezebel controlled Ahab. Uh, Herod's adulterous woman next to him controlled him. She wanted John the Baptist's head. So the woman controls the beast system. She wants to be the head. Okay. So she's riding on this beast. And it says here, there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So five of them will fall. All religions will have joined together. All currencies will be one currency. All religions will be joined together in the name of love and tolerance. And so my question to Father was, where does AI come into all of this? Because we know that artificial intelligence is the talk of the day. And somehow it has to fall into this whole system. So how does this whole system work? We know that the mark of the beast is linked to AI. But that can't be all. And this is what came to my mind. That when AI takes over, as they've started to now, whether it's brain implants, whether it's access through being connected to the system, whether it's humanoids or clones, you name it. All will be equal on footing with no rights. They have equal footing with no rights. So you can have your robot, housemaid or girlfriend, right? And will have the same rights that you have. So there will be no difference between that which is human and that which is artificial. So that the clay and the iron will mix. But the word says they will not be able to mix. But they will be seen on equal footing to the point where AI will completely take control. But in order for AI to take control, it has to be placed on equal footing with man. And to be placed on equal footing with man, there has to be no rights. Only laws. And they may will make sure that when the martial law breaks out, that that will be controlled by artificial intelligence. You will have nowhere to go. Can you think of the responsibility that the apostles and prophets have to protect the flock in the time to come? It's huge. I mean, I'm just speaking about a small portion. And John... Remember, the beloved, the Benjamin, was told by Yeshua in, John, in, in Revelations 1 to send letters to all the churches. So the Johns, the Benjamins, will be sent to all the churches to address these very issues that's being discussed, um, that are being discussed in the churches. So the issue will not just be false doctrine, but protecting the flock against the system. Okay, covenant has with it blessings and curses. In the end, what they will be, the church, is covenant breakers. And the whole purpose with a blessing of, of covenant is the blessing was to inherit the land, to possess the land, to inherit the land. And a land means nothing with families and children. And what the, the, the apostles and prophets are, is they are protecting the children, the inheritance 
of God. So when they break covenant, when the servants who are seduced by Jezebel and believing her doctrine and the church fall for the system, they are breaking covenant with God. And not only that, they are stealing his inheritance, which is they are stealing his children. They are trafficking in his children. They are making them children of harlots, of harlotry. And we are co-heirs with Christ according to Romans 8. We, as the mothers and fathers, the foster mothers and fathers and pillars, are responsible to make pillars of our sons and daughters, those who have given us. Therefore, this disposition of innocence and guilelessness is so important to protect us against the spirit of pride, but to have the disposition of a ravenous wolf as one who has gone through the fire and therefore judgment as fire can come out is what God is working in us. I just want to finish off with a prayer. Father, I thank you for this teaching. I know it's quite long. As taxing as it was, Father, even to speak it, how much more, Father, to live it. I just bring everybody to you, Lord, including myself. As Paul, we say, Father, who is sufficient for these things? This is too big for us, Father. But you are our friend that sticks closer than a brother. You will never forsake us. You are with us, Father. And you have chosen us for this time to go forth and do valiantly for you, my God. Not in our own strength, but as children utterly depended upon you. Because you told me years ago, you said, Father, you said to me, your strength is only as great as your dependence upon me. Father, we cast ourselves upon you. Work in us this disposition. Thank you for giving us understanding. Come and have your way on those ones you have chosen. Baptize us with fire. Baptize us with fire, my God. Pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.